Hello, my name is Giselle, and I'm a volunteer here at Set Free. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this sermon video. We want to know what special and exciting things God is doing in your life. If there is anything we can do to serve you, to be in prayer about or celebrate with you, email us at hello at setfreecf.com. We pray that you are blessed by this message. Lamentations chapter 3. Y'all know where Lamentations is? It's right there around Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22 and 23. Everybody there go, uh huh. It is of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. That ought to bring a thank you right there. It's of the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new, his mercies are new every morning. And great is thy faithfulness. I just want to read that again. It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Go over to the New Testament, the book of Titus. Y'all know I'm a scripture lover. If you don't like your Bible, you don't need to come here. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says, It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. Here we go. But according to His mercy, He saved us. According to His mercy, He saved us. Obviously, I want to talk to you about mercy this morning, but I want to talk to you in specific about living in a house of mercy. Living in a house of mercy. The Hebrew, Greek definition, Webster definition, all combined of mercy is this. To show kindness and compassion. Mercy is a refraining from the enforcement of something or a law concerning a debt or a penalty or when one breaks the law. It's the refraining from enforcing something. It's the refraining from enforcing the law. I'm telling you something. I'm glad I live in a house of mercy. I'm glad that God showed mercy to me, showed mercy to you. I'm glad that His mercies are renewed every day. I'm thankful for mercy. I'm glad that I got mercy instead of what I should have got. How about you? You know, it's been said before, and I'll say it again just in passion, the difference in grace and mercy. Grace is you receive what you didn't deserve. We receive salvation and healing and blessing. Mercy is you don't receive what you do deserve. I'm glad that we don't receive what we do deserve. There were two men went up, a, a publican and a Pharisee, and they went into the temple to pray, and the uh, Pharisee, he lay down, and he said, Lord, I want to thank you that I'm not like other people. I want to thank you that I'm not like that old publican. I want to thank you that I fast every week two times, I pay my tithes, I keep all the laws. Lord, I just... Thank you for me and all of my righteousness. Church people. And then, then the publican, it says, he was laying on his face and wouldn't even lift his eyes up. And he said, God, could you have mercy on me, a sinner? I'm telling you, I'm thankful that when this old sinner came to God and said, Lord, I need mercy. I need grace. I'm thankful that He did for me what nobody else could do. Don't look like nobody in here has had any mercy to give to Him this morning. But A lady was walking through the park. And an older gentleman come up with one of the old Polaroid cameras. You know, it spits out the picture and develops. And he snapped her picture right quick. And she smiled. She was complimented that he would take her picture. And she watched it as it developed. The smile left her face. She said, "Oh, this is not a good picture. This is this is no good. This is a this is a horrible picture. You haven't done me justice." The old man said, "Lay, you don't need justice. You need mercy with that face." (laughs) 
<laughs> so when I talk about mercy, of course my mind goes to the mercy seat. The Ark of the Covenant. And the mercy seat which covered the, the Ark of the Covenant. Over in Exodus, go over there with me right quick. Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25 and verse 21. God's giving instructions about this mercy seat. In verse 21 there, He says, You shall make the mercy seat above the ark. The mercy seat was the lid, the covering that sat on the ark. The ark was the box of God. It had the, uh, the, the Ten Commandments. It had the, the, uh, the container full of uh, manna. And it had Aaron's rod that budded. This is where the glory of God would settle in the tabernacle. It says, You'll put the mercy seat above the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. Watch down verse 22. And there I will meet you. Where's God going to meet us? In the middle of mercy. There I will meet you. And I will commune with you from above the mercy seat. If you're going to have a relationship with God, you're going to find it in His mercy. Because let me tell you, you're not worthy to have a relationship with God without His mercy. Then you go over to Numbers. Chapter uh, 7, Numbers chapter 7, and verse 89, and it says, And when Moses was coming to the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, speak with God, he heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony between the two cherubs. He, or God, spake with him from off the mercy seat. The mercy seat was a golden lid. A cap that fit over this uh, this um, ark, which was barely three foot by about two foot, and it was a golden lid. And God said, "It's right here on this mercy seat. If you're going to have a relationship with me, if you're going to live in a house of mercy, if you're going to receive mercy and learn to give mercy, you're going to understand that it's right here on this mercy seat with the two cherubims over it. The mercy seat is where God." had him sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice. He said, if you're going to have a relationship with me, you're going to understand that it's through the blood and it's through my mercy and I'll cover everything I do with you through my blood, my son's blood and through my mercy. Let's not underestimate... There's been a lot of teaching today about grace, 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 grace. And I believe in grace. But let's not underestimate the power of mercy in our lives. I'm starting slow and y'all are amen in me slow. It's okay. Remember when the Philistines invaded Israel and stole the Ark of the Covenant? And God, who has a sense of humor, struck them all with hemorrhoids? That's what happened. And, and so these Philistines, they, they decided they going, we got to get rid of this Ark. It's killing us. It's a real pain in the rear. We got to get rid of it. And so they, they made little they made little golden hemorrhoids and put it on the on a cart with the ark. And they they said just put it behind some cows and wherever they take it, let it go. Just get it out of here. And the cows took it into a certain village there in Israel. And the Bible says that the men there in Israel got curious. And they wanted to see what was inside the ark. I mean they knew what was in there. It's, the Ten Commandments, the manna, and Aaron's rod that budded. But I, I guess maybe they thought the Philistines had had it. Something was different. I don't know. So them brothers lifted the lid, the mercy seat, off of the ark. God, by His Spirit, jumped up out of that ark and killed 50, a little over 50,000 of them before they could get the lid back on the ark. I said, when they took the mercy off of God, and all, all they had Giselle was the law, 50,000 of them died. Let me say that again so it will get in your spirit. I said, without the mercy, and all they had was the law, 50,000 of them died. We better thank God that His mercies are renewed every day. And we better thank God that He said, I will meet you at the mercy seat 
because you ain't even worthy to come and approach God. But there's a place of mercy that God said, I have to have mercy for you. And you know, the Bible tells us plainly, we can't fulfill the law. We can't live the law. I'm going to tell you, no matter how hard you are trying, you will never live good enough to have the right relationship that you want with God. You better plead God's mercy every day. You better thank God for His grace. And you better understand that if He wasn't a merciful God, that every day didn't give you mercy. But religion will lift the mercy seat off. Religion loves to lift the mercy seat off and judge you just by their religion. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. If you're going to have a relationship with God, listen, understand, anything God does in your life, any blessing that He puts in your life, any anointing that He lets you have, any gift of any spirit that you might get to flow in, anything that you believe in for in your family, God save my son, save my daughter, save my mama, save my... Any of that. If any of that's going to happen in your life, you have got to come to God and understand, God, the only place that I can even dream that I can meet you is on the mercy seat. That's where you will meet me, God. I, God, I'm asking you to save my family. But what I'm really asking you to do is give mercy to my family. They deserve to go to hell, but don't let them go to hell. God, I'm asking you to bless me in this area. But what I'm really asking you to do is bless me where I don't deserve to be blessed. Give me mercy. Give me mercy. Here's the point. To experience the life of God. We've got to cover ourselves in God's mercy. And we've got to cover others with mercy. Now see, we all about getting God's mercy on us. Oh God, give me mercy, give me mercy. Lord, mercy, mercy. Your Honor, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. But when somebody else needs a little mercy from us, Why is it that we expect God to give us of all, forgive us of all of this? And then we'll hold the least little thing against somebody and hope to die and go to hell over it. Uh, we got to live in a house of mercy. Listen, they some, I can promise you this. There are some people, some relationships, some blessings that God would have in your life that if you would show them mercy, if you'd quit passing judgment on it, they'd come alive to you. Listen, remember, remember Aaron's rod? Old dead stick off an almond tree? Just an old dead stick off an almond tree. And they laid it in the Holy of Holies up next to the mercy seat. And they come back in the next morning, and that old dead stick, stick was alive had bloomed, had blossoms on it, had almonds hanging on it. I'm telling you, there's some things that you think are dead in your life. Some things that you think went the wrong way. I'm going to tell you something. Just like God reached down in mercy and pulled you up out of that mess that you come up out of, there's some people, I'm promising you, there's some people in your life that if you'll go back and show mercy to them, It'll bloom and blossom all over again. Now, I ain't telling you to go back to your ex-wife when she's married somebody. That ain't what I'm saying. They some devils you never bring into the house. But watch this. I, I need here, here. I guess here's what I'm trying to say. God covers and puts mercy right up in the middle of everything He does with us. We need to have mercy as the balance, the pivot, as the center of our lives. We need, that needs to be the, or, uh, the point of origin. We need to start from the place of mercy. Give me nine. I need nine people. It don't matter if you're a guy, a gal, whatever. I just need nine people to come stand right up here on this platform. Don't everybody rush me at once. Nine of you. 
I'm going to be kind to you, put you in the middle. You get right in the middle, okay? I need four on one side of Giselle and four on the other side. Y'all get in a single line right there. Now watch this. Do I have nine behind me? Yes, sir. Nine gifts of the Spirit. Now watch this. Watch what God does. I'm reading the Beatitudes. I want you to see this. Raise your hand as we go as I read them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, Sorry to give you that one, Jason, but. <laughs> Blessed are the meek. Is that you? <laughs> well, God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> this is you. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, but they shall see God. I said poor, pure, excuse me. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted. Finally, Blessed are you when men revile you. Now, wait a minute. Look at this real close. Look at these nine Beatitudes up here. What stands out about this? We've got four, and we've got blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Then we've got four over here. Look at this visual. God put it in the Bible this way. Right in the middle. Right up in the middle of all of these blessings. Lock arms with each other. Everybody lock arms with each other. Look what's holding. Come on, Mercy, get straight now. Look what's holding all these blessings together. Mercy has got all of it. Hold up, man. Hold up. I said mercy is right up in the middle. We need to learn to live in a house of mercy. We need to receive mercy. And if we're going to walk in the fullness of God, we've got to learn to give mercy. Hallelujah. Now, you three stay and the rest of y'all go. Just you three stay. Watch this scripture. I'm going over to the book of Micah. I'm in chapter 6. And I'm in verse 8. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. This is what's good. This is what you need to do. And what the Lord requires of you. To do justly. To walk humbly. But right in the middle of that, it says... To love mercy. Do justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Y'all can go sit down. Thank you. You know what? Mercy should be the center of our, our thought life. Mercy. We wouldn't judge so we wouldn't judge so hard if we would give mercy. Let me read you a scripture. 
And then I want to talk to you about the pool of Bethesda. Second Samuel chapter 22 and verse 26. 22 and 26 says, With the merciful, thou or you, God, with the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. You know there's a scripture that says, Judge not, lest you be judged by the same measure. Yep. Neighborhood I grew up in, we would say, What goes around comes around. Be merciful, and God will show himself merciful to you. The pool of Bethesda was a, a, a spring of water. They had built a pool, a fountain around it. They had covered it with a top. And they had five porches around the, the fountain. Steps that go up to the porches and you go over down and get into the water and set up under the cover to get into the water. And from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir that water up. And the first one that would get in would get healed of whatever infirmity they had. There was this brother for 38 years who somebody would drag him to the steps at one of the porches and he lay on a cot, crippled, lame in his legs. And the angel would come down and stir up the water and the first one in would get healed. But because he was lame, somebody always beat him in. 38 years this brother had been laying at one of those five porches. You would think that after 38 years, somebody would say, hey, hold up everybody. This guy, his whole life he's been here. He deserves to get in and get healed. But everybody pushed himself ahead of him. Jesus comes along and just says to him, you want to be healed? Well, yes, I do. Well, take up your bed and walk, man. And he hopped up and walked off hill. But here's the point that I'm making. In my mind, those five porches represent the fivefold ministry gifts of God. They represent the church. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. And they're at a place called the Pool of Bethesda. Listen to this. Bethesda means a house of mercy. The fivefold ministry gifts should function as a house of mercy. Churches should be mercy headquarters. Everybody in the church world shouldn't be trying to trample ahead of everybody else, get notice for their anointing, get notice for how many people they got in their church. Get, that's my song, let me sing it. That's my time to preach. I, 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 I don't want to attend to no nursery. I want the big spot. I want to do, everybody wants to trample ahead, notice my gift. I got a card that says I'm an apostle. I'm one of them porches. Everybody wants to get in before everybody else. When Jesus came to the one that had no hope and gave him mercy, I'm thinking probably in churches all across America, there are broken, impotent, hurting, depressed, sick people that have laid in our churches for years and will continue to come to church year after church, year after year after year, and they never get what they want because they come into an old hard religious atmosphere. It's all about bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. And nobody has a heart of mercy. Nobody feels their infirmity. Jesus was touched with the feeling of our infirmity. That's mercy. Maybe every once in a while we ought to get our eyes off of ourselves and ask God to let us feel somebody else's pain and let us feel somebody else's need. It ain't all about you. If we could, in mercy, pick up everybody in this church that's hurting. If we could pick them up. Stop judging them. Stop being hateful. Stop being competitive. 
And just, just help them on up in mercy to the mercy seat. If we could just say, look, I was right where you was. And I had to have help. And God had to do something for me. And listen, I, I, know, I know God would do it for you because He did it for me. If, if we could just forget that we've been saved for decades and go back and remember what it's like to be shaky in your faith and just barely be hanging on and cover somebody with mercy and blood and pull them up. Get them into the pool. Get them into the house of mercy. Do you know why I think that David was shown... You know, David had sex with his... committed adultery with his neighbor's wife. Then had the neighbor killed in battle. And God sent the prophet in to give him mercy. And David repented and he had mercy. You know why I think God... I mean, God would have... could have, should have struck this king dead. Or at least took his kingdom from him. But he didn't. He, God gave him great mercy. Do you know why I think God gave him mercy? The merciful shall receive mercy. When, when David became king, I'm talking to you about learning to function in mercy. Just because somebody deserves it don't mean you've got to give it to him. But when David became king, he was supposed to kill the whole family of the previous king. There was supposed to be nobody, not one seed left from Saul. And David's men pretty well took care of it for him. And one, day, one day David walked out and said, whoa, 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 slow down. Is there not anybody left of the house of Saul that I can show mercy to? This is what made David a man after God's own heart. Because when he had the upper hand, he said, is there not somebody that I can show mercy to? And they said, well, there's one. Saul had one. I think it's his grandson, Elder. I think it's his grandson. He said, oh, Mephibosheth. He's got one guy left, but, but, uh, but he's lame on his feet, and he's over here in, in, in Lodabar. And, 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 uh, and David said, bring him to me. They said, bring him to you? you gonna, we, we don't have to bring him here for you to kill him. We can kill him over there. He's lame. He's nobody. He's, in, he's not important. David said, bring him to me. I want to show mercy to him. And he brought him in, set him up on his own, set him at his own table, and let him eat the king's food. And you know what, Ron, when he pulled Lodabar, pulled uh, Mephibosheth out of Lodabar up to his table in Jerusalem, set him up to his table, he was eating the king's food, he was living the king's life, and you couldn't even see his crippled legs. They were hid under the king's table. I said, when we show mercy, when we show mercy, we don't look at people's faults. We don't look at their messes. Judging a mess is not showing mercy. I know this is not Pentecostal enough for y'all, but I think that David, I think God gave David mercy because David gave Mephibosheth mercy. That, that's just what, that's just what I think. I I could be wrong. Now watch. Here's how you're going to walk in mercy. I I'm, I'm, don't mean to belittle the same point, belabor it, but here's how you're going to walk in mercy. Come up here, Anthony. The, there was two cherubims over that, over that ark of the covenant, on each end of the seat. Face me, Anthony. Both of the cherubims had their wings forward. Put your wings forward, Anthony. Up. Oh, there you go. Touch mine. And there was over that ark where the blood was going to go, where the mercy was, where God's glory... That's where the glory shone off that mercy seat in the Holy of Holies tabernacle. And these two cherubims were on each side of it. But you know, there was touching, but you know what the Bible said that they was how they were created? They wasn't looking at each other eye to eye. They were both looking down at the mercy seat. I said they were connected. And the glory of God was going to show up between them. But they weren't connected looking at each other. They was connected viewing each other through the mercy and through the blood of the sacrifice. And when they got their eyes off of each other, 
and got their eyes on the mercy of God, they could connect and the glory of God would show up. Let me tell you something. You don't have to see eye to eye with everybody on 100% of the things that you bump up against them to have mercy with them. Everybody don't have to be a clone of you, think just like you, talk just like you, have your same background for you to have a relationship with them and, and see the glory of God in your relationship. Mercy says this, we don't have to see eye to eye. I don't have to understand everything about you. All I need to see you is through the mercy of God and through the blood of God. And if God has accepted you, if God has saved you, then I need to know that our wings have touched and God's going to show up in the middle of our relationship. I'm going to give you mercy for the things that I don't understand. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment, the anointing of God that ran down the beard and the garments of Aaron. And the Bible says, and for there has God commanded a blessing. Show me some mercy. Don't view me through my flesh. Because I got a bunch of it. And you do too. Show mercy. If you want the anointing of God in your life, be merciful. Quit being mean. I hate mean people. I hate all this meanness that's in our country right now. I hate it. Stop judging people and holding grudges against people. If they're not just like you, you ain't got nothing to do with them. Give me mercy. Give people mercy, even if they are different from you politically. If they are a different color skin, give them mercy. If they are, listen, just because they go to a different church and they have a different faith, let me tell you something. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that His blood washes you from the sin, if you believe that He raised from the third day and is resurrected and said at the right hand of the Father, and if you believe this book and only this book, then me and you are brothers and sisters. I, I don't care if you talk in tongues or not. If you love Jesus, I love Jesus. I got a big revelation for you right here. Give mercy to your family members. Oh, we'll forgive other people, but we'll hate our family from now on. You know what? It might just be that God could heal some things in your family and y'all could actually have Thanksgiving dinner together. For the first time in 20 years. If you would just be merciful. Well, they won't be. Well, that's all right. They're heathens. You're a Christian. Learn to hold your tongue and your attitude and alert your face. Not to be making all them faces when you're around. Don't roll your eyes. Just have some mercy. I know, listen, I know, I hope I don't offend nobody, but I know there's, you don't want their stinking cigarette self in your house. I know that you don't want to smell the alcohol on them. But did God show you mercy? Yes, they hurt you. Yes, they're your family and they disappointed you. Yes, they bring shame on your family name. And yeah, they used you. They borrowed that money. They didn't pay it back. They took advantage of you. Yeah, all that happened. It really did happen. Yeah, they are some scoundrels. But they're your blood. They're your family. And God said His mercies are renewed every morning. 
You, you know, you can be disappointed in somebody in your family and still love them. You, just because they've got a sin or a problem don't mean you're supposed to cut them off and act like they're not even alive. You love them and have mercy. How in the world are they going to get straight if they're not around people that's got the answer? Hey, I got a word for you. Cut them some slack. You're not their Savior. I'm preaching a whole lot better than y'all nodding your heads. Was Jesus a friend of sinners? Did He hang out with wine bibbers? Did it won't hurt you to get around your heathen family? I'm a Christian. They ain't going to do that up in my face. Maybe you being a Christian will convict them when they're doing that. I'm telling you, back before all of Donna's family got saved, and they're still having big Christmas things at her mama's house, whatever, they're all saved now, but back in the day when I was in my 30s, I was already a pastor, and there was heathens going out drinking, coming back in, cigarettes everywhere, all in the house. I hate to go over there. I, 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 if you smoke, I love you, but I hate cigarettes. They stink. But anyway, here's the deal. Here's what I found out. Every room I would go in, Barry, there'd be 20 of them in a room. I'd go into that room. Five minutes later, I'm sitting in there by myself. <laughs> They'd be in the next room. I'd go in the next room. Five minutes later, I'm sitting in there by myself. But I didn't, call, I didn't act like they treat them like they was a bunch of heathens. I just kept, wherever it is at, I'd go in the next room, smile at them. Hey, what's that? Because I knew they was running from the Holy Ghost. Yeah. God, show you this. Show your family some mercy. They goofy. We know they goofy. Just love them anyway. I'm giving y'all some good family counseling. Here's what you quit. Here's what you need to quit doing. Quit making demons out of them. They're not demons. They just lost. Say it again. Quit treating your family like you think they're a devil out of hell. They're not a devil out of hell. They just lost. I want to show you something here in just a minute. If you guys are ready back there, get ready for me. I see you jumping around. I've caught you off guard. Michelangelo. How many of y'all you know Michelangelo, the great artist? When, when Michelangelo, this is Moses. Have you ever seen this, the statue of this picture? When he painted Moses, when he did this statue, he put horns on his head. He's got horns on his head. Y'all see them horns? You know why he's got horns on his head? Because he drew his paintings before the King James Version of the Bible. He had the Latin Bible. Which was a pretty good translation, and a lot of times better than the King James. But in one particular verse, the Latin Bible misinterpreted something. When the Latin Bible says that Moses came down from receiving the Ten Commandments, you know, he had to put the veil on his face. It says that he had to put the veil on his face because his face shone. That's what your King James Bible says. And, and, and actually, in the Greek, it says because there was a, um, a funnel of lights. That came up off, funnel of lights was coming up off of him. Well, the Latin Bible misinterpreted that. And in the Latin, Latin Bible, it says that Moses came down and they had to cover his face because he had horns on his head. So Michelangelo read what the misinterpretation of the Latin interpreters was, and they said he had horns on his head. And because the Latin Bible said that Moses had horns on his head. Michelangelo pictured Moses with horns on his head. And thus we have the painting and the statue of Moses with horns on his head. Now isn't that interesting? What's that got to do with us? I just wonder. Have you heard something third hand? Has somebody told you something that somebody said something? Did you look at something that was going on and did you misread it? 
Did you catch somebody when they was having a bad day and maybe they responded the wrong way? And maybe uh, you misinterpreted what was being said and they said it one way and you took it another way. And because of that, you put horns on their head because, you know, horns represent devils. You put horns on their head and you've been seeing them as a devil now for 10 years. And no matter what they do, no matter how much they try to love on you, you got horns on their heads. I ain't going over there around my cousin. He's a drunk. He's got horns on his head. We can't have nothing to do with them Baptist brothers. They don't even believe in the Holy Ghost. So we put horns on their heads. We can't have nothing to do with them Catholic brothers. And we put horns on their heads. We can't have nothing to do with the church up the street because I heard they do this and they do that. Put horns on their head. We can't have nothing to do with that family up the road in our neighborhood. Look at that. Is your name Michelangelo? And have you painted horns on people's heads? And then, you know, the strange thing is, you get to know them, and you get in a situation where you have to deal with them, and you find out, well, old Anthony, he's not so bad after all. I guess I had him all wrong. I've been, he's had horns on his head for 10 years. I've had my mind full of all kind of thoughts about him. I wouldn't have shown him a drop of mercy. And he still ain't much to look at. But he's a good old boy. Be quiet, Anthony. <laughs> we need to have mercy for people that have straight up messed up. We need to have mercy for people when they in the middle. You, you don't somebody in the middle of a mess. You don't need to go. Well, I thought so. I told you so. Look at you. When I was in the middle of my sin, you didn't have to tell me. I knew it. Look at our example. Peter cursed and denied. God gave him mercy. Oh, Saul was out killing saints, and God gave him mercy. There was a lady caught in the act of adultery. And Jesus said, go and sin no more. I'm not going to accuse you. The prodigal son, when he came home, the father kizazad him and gave him mercy. When one lost sheep, the shepherd will leave the 99 and have mercy and go find just that one. God, Ephesians says, who is rich in mercy, saved us by His love. God is rich in mercy, saved us by His love. I won't set free to be a house of mercy. I think the more mercy we have, y'all, some of y'all going to draw back on this, the more messes He can send us. And I love seeing messes get saved and sanctified and filled with the Spirit of God. And God start. I love to see mess. People don't want to touch messes. I say send the messes here. We, we, the Holy Ghost ain't afraid of them. They ain't nobody's mess going to mess up the Holy Ghost. We could have some upper end messy people too come in. That'd be all right. We'd love them. We, we love upper end. We'll take their ties too. Come on in with your mess. And, and we'll accept you and take you. That Pharisee said, I thank God I'm not like this publican. That 
publican wouldn't even lift his head. He said, Lord, if you can, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I just wonder today if there's any of us that we just need to find some mercy. Maybe we need to just get saved. Find the mercy of God just to get saved. Maybe we just need mercy because our flesh has been up and on us. Maybe we need the mercy to show mercy. Maybe while I was preaching, some of you thought about how you'd been real mean to somebody because you disapprove of how they're living. Might just be this week you need to go find them and love on them real good. If you would like prayer or to talk with someone, contact us at 864-269-3620 or at hello at setfreecf.com. It is because of your generosity that we are able to expand our reach for the kingdom. So if you are blessed by this ministry and would like to donate or learn more, please visit us at setfreecf.com. Thanks again for joining us today. And we pray that you have a radically blessed week.